my job is already half done by my previous two speakers. So I won't dwell on what was already spoken about in terms of uh, what is the ICO examination, what do we do? The ICO, as we know, is, is, is a body that, prof is, that represents professional of, of pharmacology associations across the world. Headquarters based in SF, in examinations in London, the International Fellowships Office. It truly is an international organization, as you can see. We have a mission to, all right, I won't go there. So I'm gonna come to the main point of why the ICO examinations. It, like like has been mentioned, it's a, it's a comprehensive assessment exam that lets you know where you stand in terms of your competence of, of your knowledge of ophthalmology, your understanding. If you have your peers who have who have already taken the examination, it, it gives you a standing in terms of being on par with your peers. Like has been mentioned earlier, it is a gateway to the MRCS. And subsequently, when you do plan to apply for a, a fellowship, an ICO fellowship, to go abroad and to learn, uh, passing the examinations is, is an important uh, part of it. it. It is an asset because it, there's a better chance, like has been mentioned, uh, much, much, much better chance, to quote uh, Dr. Claire, uh, of getting a fellowship if you've cleared your examinations. <coughs> so I'm going to jump straight into my experience and not uh, uh, you know, the theoretical part of how to, of what each examination is and what the questions entail. So the basic science, the clinical, the optics and the basic sciences, the visual sciences, like Dr. Devendra mentioned, the books that you would read, that you've all heard about for your FRCS and MRCS are exactly the same that I would recommend for appearing before, that you read before appearing for your uh, ICO examinations. Optics is something that from personal experience of having gone through residency and now teaching residents, I know is something that is not stressed on during our postgraduate training that requires that special effort from our part to learn, read and understand, which is why Elkington and Dr. Kurana's Optics and Refractions are great resource books to read and uh, get a hang of the subject. Earlier, Optics and Refractions had 40 questions, but now it's, it's a paper that has 60 questions. A special mention for the clinical sciences, uh, the, the accompanying book that we all, almost all residents have during residency is uh, Clinical Ophthalmology by Bowling and Kansky. That's a great book to have read cover to cover to, to know and completely understand in depth. And that, that serves as, you know, most of your questions that you would read, would you be able to answer. Unfortunately, you know, being in the Indian educational ecosystem, we are all very, very used to reading questions that have lines straight out of the book. That is not something that you'd expect in your FIC or FRCS exams. In your exam, you're never going to get a question that straight comes, that is straight from the book. It's not going to be something that you can answer by going back to your rote memory. It almost always has practical implications of theoretical knowledge. Say, for example, you know that the test that you would do for a patient who has myasthenia gravis would be in, in clinic, the ICE, in the ICE test, then you would get antibodies, uh, single fiber EMG, and then maybe uh, muscle specific kinase antibodies. The question that you might get in your exam is a patient who's come with diurnal variation in ptosis, uh, has a negative ICE test, and has been investigated for repeated nerve stimulation or e EMG. What would your next step be that would give the highest yield in terms of diagnosis. So you need to know your order of importance and not just the memorize the list. And that is what I mean by practical implications of theoretical knowledge. Why would you want to do? Well, like, like Devendra mentioned, it's, it's an insurance policy that ensures that you're gonna read optics and refraction. When you've paid that kind of money, you almost, almost uh, always are motivated to make sure you don't have to pay it again. Taking your basic visual sciences and optics and refraction during your residency is, uh, it almost supplements and complements your structured three-year residency curriculum where you can take your optics and refraction basic sciences in the first or second year of residency and the clinical sciences after you've completed your residency so that A, you're well prepared in terms of your knowledge levels and uh, B, you're at the right time because you have time on hand to prepare as well. 
Now this is something I've already explained earlier. Uh, a few uh, things to be aware about is that the ICO, like the FRCS, is not a licensing examination. Uh, it doesn't give you the permission to practice. It is, it, it, it is an assessment examination. As has been mentioned earlier, while it is recommended that you do take the examinations uh, before applying for an ICO fellowship, it may be possible to, take, uh, to, to, to have a successful application for fellowship without appearing for the examinations. And like I mentioned, it is expensive, but the prices are on their way down and they may be reduced. So that's all about the examinations. And I'm going to talk a little more in depth about ICO fellowships. This is all from the ICO website fellowships. Uh, fellowships website. These, now, these are the different types of fellowships offered. They vary from three-month fellowships to one-year fellowships. Uh, there are also six-month fellowships available. And... Uh, like I mentioned, this is the line from the uh, website. The ICO recommends that you candidates pass one or more exams. So what are your prerequisites? Now, typically for the three-month fellowships, it is essential that you have completed your residency, that you're under 40, you're fluent in English or the native language that is spoken at the center where you would be hosted. And more importantly, applicants uh, and Kodula, correct me if I'm wrong, applicants must return to their home country or have an intention of returning to their home country after their term of fellowship in, in the host country. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. That's very important. So from our perspective, like she mentioned, the most popular fellowships or the most awarded fellowships rather are the three-month fellowships, which are primarily aimed at trainees from low resource com uh, countries or developing countries where 6,000 USD is given towards your expenses of living. Uh, there are two deadlines because there are two, two sessions in which these fellowships are awarded. The first one is coming up soon at the end of next month and the next deadline would be September 30th. The other lesser known fellowships are uh, at centers, are offered at centers in India and Iran. These are, ca the candidates from India and Iran can apply for these fellowships. They are three month fellowships focused on retinoblastoma the IUSG, the U International Uveitis Society group, is also another fellowship which uh, the rules are the same, including the same the rule that applies for all previous fellowships is that once your application has been rejected, you cannot apply for that fellowship again. There is also a, a six-month fellowship on retinoblastoma, uh, which uh, again follows the same set of rules that were there for the previous fellowship. There is a one-year fellowship as well, which is the ICO Retina Research, the Hel Hel Helmerick <laughs> Fellowships. Uh, the award amounted for uh, the the award the amount awarded for this fellowship is twenty-five thousand US dollars for to cover your living expenses. However, the applicant must be accepted for an ophthalmology subspecialty fellowship for one year in duration at a center already, and they must be committed to coming back. And that is when the ICO can uh, process your fellowship and award you this. Uh, there's also the Fred Hollows Foundation One Year Subspeciality Fellowship, which is also uh, available at designated ICO fellowship training centers. The rules are, are almost the same. There used to be the ICO SARC One Year Subspeciality Fellowships. I mentioned this because we are in the Southeast Asian region. However, this is no longer offered because it was not a very popular fellowship from my understanding. Now from a personal perspective, questions that we often get asked is timing. Should a three month fellowship be done just after residency or should you have a fellowship here and then go and do it, uh, 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 the ICO fellowship after that? And I strongly recommend that all residents complete a clinical fellowship in India or anywhere else where they are going to have a comprehensive understanding of the specialty with hands-on clinical and surgical experience and only after that go into a, a short-term three-month fellowship abroad. A three-month ICO fellowship cannot be a substitute for a subspecialty fellow, clinical fellowship in India. The reason being uh, at the end of your fellowship or maybe in the beginning of your practice is when you realize what is it that you want to know more 
and what is it that you don't know and those are the things that you need to identify and decide that okay I need to get to know this and this ICO fellowship can be my tool to go learn that come back and put that into practice here uh, is it worth it I would absolutely say because it's not just like Dr. Krishna Prasad said in our residency programs it's not just clinical skills that we end up lacking a lot of things in terms of how to maximize productivity in your clinic soft skills speaking to patients running a, an effective practice these are the other things that aren't taught to you when you go to uh, you know centers up in the west these are things that you will see learn and imbibe on your own uh, is it just another extended vacation because I have I've, you know, paid for the examinations and I have applied and I am going to get money for it? Absolutely not. You should never treat it as one because this has a lot of value. And when should you really apply? And again, should I stick to the three month fellowship or the six month or the one year? That again depends on your needs, your goals and what is it that you seek to get out of your fellowship. When should I apply? Uh, for me, uh, when I applied for my ICO fellowship abroad, it was towards the end of my clinical fellowship in India and that worked out well because then there was a smooth transition to finishing my fellowship here, a short break and then going for a three month fellowship abroad. How to apply? It's an extremely easy, clear, transparent process on the website. You choose your the fellowship of interest, complete your eligibility check by filling out the details and then they let you know in 24 to 72 hours if you're eligible for that particular fellowship you choose your host training center from the list the online directory uh, you send in your application it, it gets reviewed and then you come get to know uh, whether it's been accepted or not now these are questions that you need to ask yourself and then answer like I said, you need to know what do you know and more importantly, what you don't know. So are there any specific skills that you wish to acquire? An oculoplastic surgeon may want to learn more about endoscopic surgery. A retinal surgeon may want to know more about macular hole surgery at a particular center by a surgeon who's developed a new technique. Specific things. And are you going to come back and put those skills into practice here? The practical implications of your fellowship. Don't treat it as a holiday. That is, that I strongly recommend that. We always do. What about if there's a center that I want to go to, which is not in the list of my, uh, in the ICO list? Well, this is this is a bit of communication that in an email that I had with Cordula, and I I mentioned to her that there's a center that I want to go, but it's not in your list. She replied that if it's a, if you know you already have a communication with them, you have an invitation letter asking you to come there they are not going to stand in the way and disrupt that they'd be more than happy to facilitate it but that is done on a case-to-case -case basis and i'd like uh, Cordula to clarify if, if the center is not on the list yeah you just get in touch with me and we um, see what we can do usually it, it's no problem thank you we you should yes. yeah just if you wish to apply if you Okay. If you wish to contact a center that is not in our list, just please write an email to me and we will find a way to, to do that. Right. We, thank you. Uh, we might have question? to yeah, I'll just go for the conclusion. Slides. One question that you often get asked is, can I take my family along? It is recommended that you don't. A, for ease of visa application processes. When you have your family back home, it's always easier to get a visa and lesser distractions. Uh, do I get to operate? Absolutely not. The ICO fellowship is a strictly an observership. Anything that happens beyond that is depends on the relationship uh, that you have with your surgical host, your, your mentor, your clinical uh, teacher there. You may get to examine patients, assist them in surgeries, but that's not a part of the promised curriculum. So plan and make the most out of your fellowship. Uh, I was lucky to have a great mentor in Dr. Delaroca at, at New York Eye Year Infirmary. I have been inducted as an alumni of the New York Eye Year Infirmary. Following my fellowships, we have collaborated and published multiple papers uh, from what we've learned in our time there. So it's not just a three-month thing. It can, it, it's a, it's something that you can develop and make into something much more. And at the end of the day, it's not just another four-letter F word. It has a lot of value to it. Thank you.